So um, today apparently happens to be World Series and I am thankful and appreciative that all of you took time away from World Series to come here. <laughs> so I wanted to start out with a sporting uh, a question from sports. Um, what is the most important position in American football? Quarterback. Quarterback. Everybody says quarterback, right? So, so somebody left said tackle. left tackle. Who said that? Quarterback. How did you know that left tackle, Mrs. Herman? Uh, I watched the movie. So, <laughs> so uh, the most important position, and apparently either the highest paid or the second highest paid position in football in American football is the left tackle. And the reason, and of course you would not see left tackle in the end zone celebrating a touchdown. You would not even know who that person is. But that person is crucial to the victory in football because he protects the right-handed right quarterback. He protects the running back. And without him, you don't win. And uh, the science behind it was uh, written in a book by Michael Lewis uh, called Evolution of the Game and there is a movie called The Blind Side and this is not the blind side people this is the actual mom who adopted this young man Michael Orr who went on uh, to win the Super Bowl so um, the reason I put this up is that I want to be a left tackle <laughs> for you guys I want to be a left tackle for my partners because I want to do behind the scenes work to improve your health and I want to get as many healthcare people involved in this process as possible. So these are some of my left tackles, I mean I'm a left tackle, these are some of my quarterbacks, Dr. Shah, Dr. Saman, you see Dr. Rashid out here, uh, Dr. Kumar has not come but I'm hoping that one of these days I'm going to get all of these guys on our team. Okay, so I have four goals today, four goals. One is to talk about insulin resistance. So um, you won't know what insulin resistance is, but we will go into that in detail. The second goal is to talk about the LDL cholesterol. So LDL cholesterol is what? It's the bad cholesterol. So at the end of this presentation, I want you to say, I want to redefine LDL cholesterol as not the bad cholesterol but perhaps a good cholesterol as long as the quality of cholesterol is good. So that's the second thing I want to accomplish. The third thing is very new information that I have never given to anyone uh, except for some people who have come to the office. And this is a little bit of evolution in my thinking also and that is about the role of fiber in our diet. How many people think that large amounts of fiber is essential and important in our diet? Show of hands, okay. So I would say at least 50%, the other reluctant ones may not be sure, right? How many of you think that uh, fiber is bad for us? Not, not even one, okay. So I want to convince you at the end of the presentation that large amounts of fiber are perhaps not good for us. Okay? And the last thing that I want to do is to talk about why I want a nutritional health institute. So if I can work through all four of these, that'll be great. So um, what I'm going to do is perhaps for the next 20 minutes, 25 minutes, talk about insulin resistance and maybe touch on fiber, then we're gonna take a little break, five minutes break so that you can stretch your legs, go out, use the bathroom. When you come back, I'm gonna talk for about 15 minutes about why the LDL cholesterol being high might actually be good for you as long as the quality of your cholesterol is good. And then we'll open it up for questions and we'll stop at an appropriate time. Okay, so this is a map of the United States 1989 and what you see out here is the percentage of people who are obese and out here in blue is Texas uh, roughly about 10%, a little greater than 10%. So when you talk about obesity, 
you define obesity by height, weight, that puts into a nomogram called body mass index. Gary, come on up here for a second. That's Mr. Ro Rossler. And uh, I asked him to come here because there's one thing for you to hear me talk, but there's quite another thing for you to see real life examples. Come on here, Gary. Uh, real life examples. This man was uh, about, can I say 40 pounds heavier? Mm -hmm. And uh, he is now 40 pounds lighter, healthier, faster on the bike, and he's even got a new Trek bike. Yeah. <laughs> you you, you want to take a minute and say a few things? Okay. Um, I lost uh, 40 pounds in three and a half months. And uh, mainly eating... Uh, Dr. Ali's uh, diet. I eat uh, a lot of vegetables with uh, uh, chicken and meat and doing things I haven't done in a long time like I'm eating sausage which I uh, thought sausage was bad. Um, summer sausage, eating the cheeses. Uh, on Saturdays when I ride I basically eat two lunches. I usually have uh, I go and have the uh, cheeseburger I usually have but I don't have the bread. And then when I get home a couple hours later, I have uh, cheese and summer sausage and, and celery sticks because can't have crackers anymore. So, uh, so I've changed watching the game. I ate a whole bag of pistachios last night. <laughs> but uh, I'm eating the nuts I'm, uh, on the rides. I said I don't, I usually eat a lot of carbs when I ride my bike. Now I eat uh, a little handful of nuts uh, on, on one of my uh, rest stops. So it's mainly uh, when I'm doing the vegetables, I fry it in butter, and lots of it, and so, uh, and I'm just melting away, and I don't, <laughs> and I don't understand why, because I, I don't uh, measure my, my intake, like I don't measure the, the vegetables or the meat, I eat what I want, and so I'm eating a lot, and uh, so I, Do you feel hungry these no. days? Uh, is your hunger better now with, on this diet? Yes, I, I can actually skip meals, but I don't like skipping meals. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you feel more comfortable on the bike? Are you riding yes, better? I'm riding better. I, uh, I finally got the st my stamina up since I, I got four stints in, uh, in, in the 1st of July. So, uh, How many miles do you ride a day? I ride 50 on uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, each day? Yeah. 50 what? per day? 50 per day. 50 miles and how many minutes is that? I do uh, average about 19, 19 and a half miles per hour. So that's uh, and a two and a half hours, he's I, I, 50 it's miles. It's me 15 years to get to that point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've been doing that for a long time. Are you riding that, are you riding better now than you did five to 10 years ago? Yes, I actually can go to the low, low parts. <laughs> go to the low handlebars. Uh, but uh, yeah. It's, um, I ride much better, um, I, I ride, I think I'm actually faster than I used to be, but, um, because I'm lighter, I'm not carrying the 40 pounds with me. But I walk 30 minutes every night. Well, I'm uh, very thankful for Gary to come and share his experience. Uh, he is not isolated person in our practice, we see many people like him but he's very articulate and he's very close to us because I ride with this group. So a round of applause for him, please. <laughs> so um, we were talking about uh, obesity and we were talking about body mass index. So you put height and weight and you come up with a formula. If you are between 20 and 25, you're considered to be normal weight. If you are between 25 and 30, you're considered to be what? Overweight, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're over 30, you're considered to be obese. obese. So this is what we were in 1989, about 10% obesity. Mm -hmm. And since then, the Am uh, American Heart Association, the USDA, all the doctors like me have given you advice. And if anything, Americans should have gotten slimmer. But this is the map of the US in 2010 many different colors, Texas and Louisiana, solidly about 30% or greater. So if in US I make three people stand up, 
two of them will be either overweight or obese. So the incidence of obesity and overweight is a staggering 68%. And the American population is being blamed for that. They're saying that we lack willpower, we don't have moral judgment on what to eat, and nothing can be further than the truth. The reason we are obese is because of poor poor guidelines. You've been told wrong. You've been told that you should eat the way you are eating. If you were just to change your nutritional thinking, you would not be this heavy. So this man, I took his permission, very nice man, salt of the earth man, working, listens to every single advice that you would give him. He became a diabetic. As soon as he became a diabetic, he started on metformin, then actos, then glipizide, then insulin. So I want to pause here for a second and tell you how wrong the medical profession is and how wrong I was for 25 years. Because actos is something that goes and activates a receptor in the brain that tells you to eat more. It creates feeding behavior. Although it drops your sugar, it creates feeding behavior. Glipizide increases insulin secretion and I'll tell you that when you are a type 2 diabetic your insulin levels are already high they're not working raising them higher is only going to make you gain weight when those two things didn't work they put him on insulin and when your insulin levels are high you get high blood pressure hypertension happens when you have insulin resistance so Three diabetic medications did not control his blood sugar. He's still getting heavier. He's getting hypertensive, so he's put on two blood pressure medicines and he say, you are a diabetic, you are a hypertensive, we need to give you cholesterol lowering medicines. Cholesterol low reducing medicines reduce your activity. They reduce your, they make you feel fatigued, tired, they affect your cognition. So if these medicines are so effective and if medical profession is doing such a good job, why is this man obese? Why is his diabetes not controlled? Why is he hypertensive? And he is on a bang up cholesterol reducing medicines. So why does he present to the hospital having a heart attack? So he came to the hospital having a heart attack and you can see that he has a blockage in the blood vessel out here. And for 25 years, I have been very good at opening these blood vessels. In fact, there are about 20 physicians, VIPs in this area, and many VIPs that I have worked on. And I'm very good at doing that. But I think that I wasted my talents. What I do in this room and what I do in the last three years, in terms of teaching my patients as to how you can prevent this, is a lot more important than what I have done. So I feel a lot of gratitude to my patients because you have taught me a lot about how to improve the health of our community. So I'll tell you that we took him to the heart cath lab and you can see this might play or it might not play. Okay, it didn't play, play but you can see that I improved the, uh, the blockage by putting in a stent. Okay, now I want to tell you that this man, he's called Butter Bob Briggs. <laughs> And Butter Bob Briggs has a website and he says, uh, Butter Bob Briggs will make your pants fall off. Butter Bob. And, and I, and I want to pause here and I want to tell you that I have learned a lot of this information not from medical professions. I have not learned it by going to medical societies. I have learned it from my patients and I have learned it from engineers. I have learned it from Butter Bob. Because this information is not taught, and if they taught me, I did not, I probably slept through that class. <laughs> so Butter Bob Briggs was like this, he was highly insulin resistant, he changed the way he ate, and when he changed the way he ate, his LDL cholesterol went very high. So this is the way he was eating, he was eating multi-grain bread, he was eating low-fat yogurt, he was eating vegetable oil and lean meat, lean protein. So most people would think that this is a good way to eat. Multi-grain bread is full of fiber, low-fat yogurt is good, and vegetable oil is good, but vegetable oil is one of the most inflammatory oils. So 
I want to work on insulin resistance with you. So I want to ask you, what makes our body have the sugars go up? What can we eat that would raise our blood sugars? Carbs. So sugar is kind of a carb. Eating carbohydrates will make your sugar go up. So when your sugar goes up, what happens to your insulin levels? The insulin levels will also go up, right? So what is the one macronutrient in here? Do you guys understand what a macronutrient is? So there are three macronutrients that we can eat from which we can get energy from. One of them is protein, the other one is fat, and the third one is carbohydrate, right? So there are three macronutrients. Is there something called a low carb, low fat diet? That's a question for you guys. Is there something called a low, low carb, low fat diet? Is there something like that? So a low carb, low fat diet is explained by people who don't understand the concept of nutrition. It's an oxymoron. Because our bodies can take probably about 25-30% of protein in our diet. So the remainder 70% of calories can come either from carbs or from fat. Right? So you cannot have a low carb and low fat diet. Any low carb diet has to be high in fat. So, what is the one ingredient out there that is not raising blood sugar? That's fat. And so fat does not raise your insulin levels. So, I have put this slide up. This is the Zucker mouse. And the Zucker mouse is a insulin resistance model of obesity. So I use this all the time and we play a little game here. So you take a Zucker mouse and you take a normal mouse and you give them food ad lib. They can eat as much as they want. Okay? Will the Zucker mouse get heavy? Will he, will he be obese? So I ask these questions to keep you guys involved, right? So, yes. yes. <laughs> right? Okay. Will he be just as active as the mouse that is normal in size? So he's eating as much as he wants. He's obese, but is he just as active? No. No. Not not much but pretty close okay pretty close he's not as active but pretty close okay so we change the experimental conditions because unlike humans we can make the rats eat less right so we take this rat and we say okay we're going to give you the same amount of calories that a normal rat is eating so you can't have any more so will he get obese now he's eating the same amount that the normal rat is re eating will he get obese Yes or no? Yes. Many people say yes, right? Yeah. So yes, he gets obese. But what happens to his activity? It, makes, it gets worse. It gets a lot worse. In fact, if you put food at the other end of the pen, he'll waddle up there, eat the food and sit there. He would not move. So let's change the experimental conditions even further. And the way we are going to change it is by giving him 80% of the calories that a normal mice will eat. Okay, so we're giving 80% of the calories. And I want you to tell me whether he'll get obese or no. So you're feeding him less. He'll still get heavy at the expense of cannibalizing his brain and his heart and his muscles. So in order to help with the feeding behavior and add adipose tissue with his fat, fat tissue, he will cannibalize his brain. And I have a slide about the human brain down the road that I want you to pay attention to. So it will come as a shock to you that this is how I want you to eat. When you go home, I want you to eat a predominant amount of animal sourced food, ASF as I call it, which is a chunk of meat. The fattiest meat that you can eat is GERD. This is what? That is egg yolk with butter. So one of my heroes, Andreas Einfeld, he's called the dietdoctor.com, eats like this. He checked his blood sugar after eating and this is blood sugar over six hours. What do you think happened to his blood sugar over six hours after eating that fat and protein rich meal? Stayed exactly the same. 
then he went to the society uh, for uh, the okay let me ask you when you eat like this and we're going to come to that in a little bit uh, because towards the end after the break when you eat like this is your LDL cholesterol eventually going to go up so let me rephrase that question a little bit imagine that I am obese I have you know a body mass index of 35 I'm very very heavy and my doctor puts me on that diet what will happen initially is that my LDL cholesterol may come down for several months but as I become lean like Gary or like Paul what will happen to my LDL cholesterol eventually it will always go up now it may go up a lot more in some people but the predominant response is that it will go up and I'll explain to you because you need to stay after the break after you take a little break I can't let you run away <laughs> so this gentleman Andrea Seinfeld he went to this Society of Bariatric Surgery now it's very popular in the US since most of us are obese um, they cut out a portion of your stomach so that you can only eat about a fist so that's another good way of losing weight I don't recommend it because it's got several side effects there is much better ways of doing it but he went there he was giving a talk and this is what they served this is whole wheat bread there's tuna it's, it's a tuna sandwich uh, there's low fat yogurt and an apple he said he didn't eat the Snickers bar or whatever that chocolate bar is what do you think happened to his blood sugar after he ate that so it went up into the pre-diabetic range or uh, actually uh, 180 uh, bit less than 200 but above 140 is pre-diabetic range and at about four hours six hours he's feeling a little hungry because his sugar actually dropped so what happens when you eat like this to your cholesterol level in other words you are eating a complex carb a complex carb diet whole wheat bread is a complex carb diet I always ask this question of my patients if I eat a slice of whole wheat bread and I check my blood sugars for six hours and on the next day I put four teaspoons of sugar or actually five teaspoons of sugar and I check my blood sugars at for six hours the next day which one will raise my blood sugar higher the bread, the bread. that's excellent okay so what I want to do is to skip some slides because I want to kind of tell you a little bit more detailed about um, what diabetes is okay so this is Dr. Fung Jason Fung and in a diabetic situation our cells are filled with sugar the cells already have a lot of sugar and there's also high sugar in the blood so as a physician what we do is we say hey we cannot see high sugars in the blood what we need to do is to reduce your sugar so like let me ask you a question and the question is that let's say you had pneumonia and you had a fever and your doctor said you have pneumonia you have fever what I want to do is to give you Tylenol so that your fever comes down and you will get better you would say no that's not right I need antibiotics to treat my infection to fight my bugs right mm -hmm. similarly when you are diabetic your high sugars is a symptom like fever but the high insulin level is the culprit that is causing all the problems so almost everything we do in medicine does what it increases your insulin levels so that you can drive more sugar into the cells and when you drive more sugar into the cells are you getting going to get heavier yes are you going to get high blood pressure yes so we behave like this we are going on a vacation we have a suitcase that is full but you need to get that last sweater in there <laughs> so you're going to shove it in there or we behave like this which is a Japanese strain and and these people are designed to function like insulin and these are all sugar molecules so they come in and they shove the people into the train so that's what we did and that's what we keep doing you go to a physician he prescribes you medicines that will increase your insulin levels rather than talking to you and saying that hey listen you have hyperinsulinemia you have a high insulin state 
what you need to do is to reduce your insulin levels through strategies that we are talking about not increase your insulin levels because that's going to cause high insulin level is going to cause heart disease it's going to cause dementia it's going to cause cancers it's going to cause strokes so I'm telling you guys I want you to eat cook in lard cook in butter have triple cream cheese have uh, sour cream have the chicken with the skin on have salmon uh, I mean have tuna have salmon this is bacon I mean I wish I could eat bacon uh, my wife would not let me eat bacon but this is a healthy food <laughs> this is I eat bacon every day um, this is when I ask you guys to go buy food I ask you to buy meat burger meat that is 80 20 I wish I could say buy 70 30 but 80 20 is the maximum fat we have been so restricted in our thinking that fat is bad that you can't find burger meat that is fatty I want you to buy the fattiest cuts of meat I'm going so <laughs> Excellent, Samir. <laughs> so what happens to your insulin levels on a high fat, low carb diet? Does it, does it fall or does it increase? Oh. It falls. When, you, when your blood sugar remains more stable, your hunger is more controlled. And if you are heavy, if it, let's say I'm, uh, you know, body mass index of three, uh, 35, 250 pounds, mm -hmm. my body is making a lot of a hormone called leptin. Our fat cells elaborate leptin. Leptin goes and tells the brain, stop eating. However, the leptin does not work if your insulin levels are high. The brain cannot see leptin if your insulin levels are high. So what I'm trying to tell you is strategies through which you can reduce your insulin level so that you don't feel hungry. Gary is eating all the fat and he said he has better control over his hunger now than he had ever before. Is that correct Gary or am I putting words in your mouth? That's true. I'm not hungry at all. All right. Now I promised you that I'm going to talk to you about fiber and then you know I think I'm doing good on time. Um, so I have learned a lot of this from Amber Ohan. She is one of my heroes. I highly recommend that you go to YouTube and listen to her because although she is monotonous, her wordings are measured. She gives you the most relevant information and I have heard her 10 times because before I could understand. You know, I'm, a, I'm the type of learner that I have to hear something 10, 15 times before it gets into my brain. So Amber Ohan found herself about 60 pounds heavier and she came across this uh, weird society which is called carnivorous society. So who is a carnivore? Well you guys are but a carnivore is one who eats only animal sourced food, eats only meat. So she has bipolar disorder, she has mood stability disorder, she's got depression. And she came to this for weight loss, she lost 60 pounds and she says I'm not a zealot, I'm not an ascetic, I'm a hedonist which means seeking pleasure and I'm not afraid of plant food, I came here for fat loss but I stayed for mood stability, you know. So I have been experimenting with this and as a physician I have a lot of stress. And I can tell you that I'm much more able to deal with stress because I'm a fan of Amber and I have learned from her and I have changed my thinking about fiber and vegetable based food. So I used to say good carbs and yes good carbs are better than junk carbs. So let's talk about what is a junk carb. Is whole wheat bread junk carb? Yes. Yes. Is sugar junk carb? Yes. Are french fries junk carb? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so anything that is processed is Cheerios. You know, do you, have you guys had whole wheat Cheerios? Looked at the yeah. packet? Yeah. It is recommended by the American Heart Association as a heart healthy diet. About 80% of that is nothing but sugar or bread. Is whole wheat Cheerios healthy? No, no. that's junk carbs. 
Now good carbs are carbs coming from fibrous vegetables. Fibrous vegetables are broccoli, spinach, avocados which have a lot of fat and fiber. And I used to recommend that you guys have plenty of this. Have as much as you can fill up. But now I say that the amount of fiber that you should have is perhaps between 30 and 50 grams. And I have changed similarly. Why do I say that? So I want to tell you what a ruminant is. Do you know what a ruminant is? So multiple stomachs. Wow, you are really great. So a ruminant, <laughs> sheep, cattle, cows, goats, deer, they mainly eat grass. They eat low quality forage. And by that I'm not passing a value judgment. They chew it continuously, they process repeatedly. And what does grass have? Grass has nothing but fiber right fiber has no nutritional value for humans in other words we cannot derive calories from fiber so if we eat fiber we cannot use that fiber it'll provide bulk it'll reduce the absorption of sugar it may do some good things for you but you cannot use it as calories so why is a ruminant able to use that fiber and like, like let's say I take a goat and I make them eat the grass which is fiber they will get fat okay you can make you can fatten up a ruminant by eating fiber the reason is is because when they eat they have four stomach like we were pointed out but they also have what is called a rumen which is a chamber in which they are fermenting that fiber the fiber is being fermented by bacteria fiber is food for bacteria and the bacteria ferment the fiber to what? I'll give a price to somebody who says that, huh? They ferment it to fat. So our sheep and goat that are eating fiber are eating a lot of fat. They ferment it to what is called short chain fatty acids, which the sheep absorbs and gets heavier. So in human evolution, our brain size increased dramatically. About 2 million years ago, our brain size was 500 cc's. It went up all the way to 1500 cc's. And it did that for whatever reason, but when it did that, what happened is that humans needed to have large amounts of energy to feed the brain. The brain, which we have is about 1200 to 1500 cc's, is very energy demanding. It uses about 25% of our calories. So our humans, as humans, we need to feed the brain. And our ancestors fed their brain by eating a lot of fat. So their brain size was all the way up. About 10,000 years ago, we started using grains, plant, plant-based food, because the megafauna, the, the killing the animals to get their fat was not easily available. And there are some anthropologists who think that because we went to a grain-based diet, our brain has actually shrunk a little bit. So you can see that it's, it's shrunk there out, out, out there. So um, this is a little bit out of order. Um, but um, what I want to tell you is that the reason you cannot use fiber is because we don't have a fermentation chamber. And uh, I don't know why it doesn't show up there. There was a slide up there that I'll bring up in a little bit. but. If you look at our stomach, our stomach has hydrochloric acid. It has no bacteria. If you look at our small intestines, the small intestines absorb food, but they have no bacteria to ferment. The only place where you can ferment food is in the colon. It's in the large colon. And if you compare the size of our colon to the size of colon of chimpanzees to uh, other non-human primates, our colon is probably about 10% that size. So we have lost the ability to ferment fiber to food. And all these things about probiotics and all that may be important, but I think are being oversold because our major digestive systems are bacteria free. And what you ferment in the colon is not providing you with any significant nutritional value. In fact, if you eat a lot of fiber, you will feel bloated, you will have a lot of bowel movements, and I'm not sure how much benefit it's going to provide. So I say that if you 
are constipated, then eat about 35 to 50 grams of fiber. But I predominantly want you to eat animal sourced food. And if you eat fat, if let's say, by that I'm not passing an ethical argument. I'm not passing a religious argument. So if you are a vegan or if you don't eat animals because of ethical reasons, environmental reasons, religious reasons, I have no argument. I'm just giving you an evolutionary reason as to why we are closer to the carnivorous animals like lions, tigers and cats based on our digestive system compared to somebody who is a herbivorous animal like the ruminants or like our primate ancestors. Now plants also cause biochemical warf warfare for us because the only way they can defend themselves is through chemicals. So these chemicals they prevent insects from eating them. Uh, they elaborate alkaloids that can cause uh, issues with us. They are bitter. You can alter them by cooking them. They have glycosides that can cause problems with the way you breathe, like cyanide is a glycoside. Um, they have some um, volatile oils like turpentine in citrus fruit. Phenolics are probably something that all of us are aware of, like flavonoids, tannins. These prevent the absorption of protein. So the plants do elaborate certain things that are not necessarily good for us. So the ASF society believes that if you want to improve your health, go to a predominant uh, animal-based diet. There is another argument that I want to give you before giving you a five-minute break, and that is that there are seven nutrients that you cannot get from plant food. In other words, these are nutrients that are very important for our brain health, for our overall health. One of them is vitamin B12, only found in animal food. Creatinine, which is important for muscle function. Carnosine, which also helps in the brain. Vitamin D3, not found in animal food. This is the omega-3 fatty acid that is active, which is the DHA. So in other words, when you come to me, I say, hey, don't get your omega-3 from plant sources, because when you take, like, let's say, flax seed or chia seeds, you're not able to convert that omega-3, which is in ALA form, to the active form that our brain needs, which is the DHA. Our body has a receptor to absorb iron that is found in muscles of animals, which is called the heme iron. We are very poor at absorbing iron from plants. And then there is another uh, pr uh, amino acid, which is called taurine, which is important for muscle function and others. So the reason I put this up for you is to tell you that if you are a vegan, number one, you are SOL. <laughs> number two is that if you are a vegan, you got to be very careful about using supplements. You may need supplements so that your brain and your muscles don't get into trouble. So um, I want to talk about LDL cholesterol. So if you guys want to give me a minute, Take a five minute break, stretch your legs, I come back and I talk, I tell you it'll be only 10 minutes and I'll give you why the LDL cholesterol is good. <laughs> 